First of all, I went to play drums, but I couldn't have a set of drums. They were too nice at home. And I probably couldn't afford them anyway. Uh, so I wanted, then I wanted to play guitar later on, and um, I got a guitar. The first guitar was one of those, well, a cheap one. Being left-handed was really difficult as well for me to get a, a guitar. So I, think I bought one from one of those K clubs or something, the original guitar. Uh, and I really enjoyed playing it. So then I wanted, of course, to be a guitar player. Yeah, I had an accident um, many years ago. Uh, as you can see here, I don't really want it there. That one, that finger, and that finger. Where I used to do sheet metal work. What happened one day, the day I was leaving, funny enough, from, from the job to turn professional, the old turn professional one. And um, I was doing some, pressing this piece of metal that I used to have to weld afterwards. And um, the, the press just came straight down on me. And of course, as you pull it back, I pulled the ends of the fingers off. And at the time, was uh, I was just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I'd done. So um, I thought that was it. I'll never play again. Um, and what happened was a, a friend of mine brought me a, a record. It was the first time I was introduced to Django Reinhardt, who had also got, you know, damaged two fingers and played with two fingers. And he got me back into playing, and I suppose it was six or seven months later. And I started trying to play with these two fingers, like that. So these were bandaged up, and I was playing with these two, which got me to use the little finger as opposed to that finger. Um, and then, of course, I went to try and find some kind of, to the hospital, try and find some kind of tip made so that I could put on. Because, of course, if I play here, that the, just, the string would just rip the skin off because the, the bone's right underneath. And, that, and they said, oh, there's nothing can be done. You'll have to pack up playing and whatever. So I went back home and I... I got a squeezy bottle and melted it down, made it into a ball, got a hot soldering iron and made a sort of hole in it, and got it down to, to fit my finger. So I got this big ball on the end of my finger. Then I sat there all night, filing it down with a, uh, some sandpaper to make a shape of a thimble. Then I put some leather on it, because it wouldn't grip otherwise. It was plastic, it'd just slip off the string. I put some leather on, uh, which made something like this, which is a plastic and then leather on it and uh, I used that and off I went. I mean, it's really weird to play with of course at first but it's, you get used to it and there's certain things I, I probably wouldn't be able to do that most people could do but there's other things I, I've come up with a different sort of style of playing and probably more unorth an orthodox way but I've got to worry. favourite guitars for me is, is uh, this one. This is the one I always use on stage now. As you can see, it's nice and tidy and clean. No marks at all on it. Uh, and this is one I've used for oh, many, many, many years. The original one I had, which I've still got at home, which I don't bring out much now, is a Gibson SG Red, cherry red one. Uh, <coughs> but this one is... Uh, is is one I do use now. And this one here, again, is another, is the first one I had made by um, John Birch. This is one of the, the earlier, first ones he ever made. That's that one. And I, I got involved with John Birch many years ago when I tried to find somebody to make me, uh, because of with my problem with my fingers and stuff, I had to try, try and create something that I could work with. So 
uh, I wanted a guitar which was easy strings, so I could bend the strings easy, which again I went into to using banjo strings for first and made my own sets up because you couldn't buy light gauge strings in them days. <coughs> and I went to approach different companies to make me light gauge strings. They said, yeah, it can't be done, it's impossible. It, w it wouldn't, be, wouldn't be harmonically right. So I said, it can be done. I've, I've done it. I've, I've, I've dropped all the strings down and made sets up from banjo strings and whatnot. And it worked for me, and I could bend them, and it was good. Uh, of course, nowadays, everybody's got light gauge strings, but in them days, you couldn't get them. So I went to John Birch to make me a, a guitar that would be comfortable for me to play too. And I wanted a 24-fret guitar. And again, I approached record, uh, record companies, uh, guitar companies, and they said, you can't make a 24 fret guitar, we only do 22 frets or 21 frets. I said, well, no, I want a 24. I'm sorry, we, we can't do that. So I got fed up of doing all this rub rubbish. So I went to John Birch and asked him if he'd... And we got involved together and I put the money up for him to start the company to start making guitars of 24 frets. And this was the first one here. Uh, and then we started experimenting with pickups and making pickups and different designs. Uh, which was the ones that's on there now, it was one, some of the first pickups we'd done. But I'd, again, I'd try them on the guitar, my old Gibson first, and try them on gigs, so I found the one that sounded right, and then I'd say, yes, is the one, and he'd make a couple the same, and then that would be it. And then JD, uh, John Diggins, who used to work for John Burt, now is in charge of his own company, who did come on the road with me and do my guitars. He now got his, his own guitar company, and he now does my stuff. And he made these pickups for me here, which I really like. And again, I can work with him like I did with John Birch. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the the big guitar companies don't seem to, or didn't seem to want to know then, or although they may want to know now. But <coughs> I think they threw a lot away by not listening. Hence the 24 frets and, and even Lucky Nuts and stuff we were getting into many years ago before these companies would, you know, give it a thought. just a, a guitar player that wants to play and whatever would be something that people would say well is unique to me it would probably be the sound and maybe just the way I approach it but how it is I don't know to explain yourself is, is quite difficult I do do vibrato on chords which um, people never use I, maybe they, they do now but I, I do a sort of play a chord with and I'll put vibrato on it which would make it you know, more full. And the reason for making it full was being as a three-piece band <coughs> and I just wanted to make it as heavy as I could so I'd play... <laughs> so I'd do those sort of things. We should sort of fill it out a bit more by putting the, putting the vibrato on it. Thank you. 
Black Sabbath again was um, done by just me playing the coming up with a riff and playing it sort of loud and it was like, Towards the end, to a, we thought it needed to change one at times, but not tempo thing. <laughs> I like a lot of the, uh, of the guitar players from, uh, like as, as your Dave Gilmore's and Brian May in particular is one of my favourite. Not only greatest friends, but he's a great player and a unique style player. Uh, and there's a lot of guitar players I, I can say I like and think are really good. They've all got their own individual. Even down to Jimmy Page's got his own individual sort of thing, style. And uh, Richie Blackmore again, unique with Deep Purple. Steve Howe was um, uh, more of a technical player to, to what I, I knew. I mean, I'm not a technical player. Steve's very technical and a great player, superb musician. Um, and I used to watch him when they used to tour with us uh, in America. They came to America with us with Yes. And uh, great players, great musicians and great guitar player. <laughs> I think uh, Guzer and Boo are great musicians. Certainly, um, I found, after, particularly now, after playing with a lot of different musicians, that Guzer and Boo are quite, uh, quite unique in, in their style of playing. That, that old style of what they played made Black Sabbath what it was. Um, Boo had a sort of a, quite an unorthodox style of playing drums. But he, when we first started, he used little teeny sticks, broken sticks, which nobody could ever figure out why, but it was just his way, you know. And uh, he came up with sort of a, an unusual sort of style, I thought. Um, and very few I found that are as good to play with as Bill. Up to, apart from Cozy, of course, who was with us now, who's great.
But most of the composing was done by Giza and myself. Giza wrote all the lyrics, uh, or at least 90% of them, and I had done the music. Um, Ozzy would come up with more of the, the, the vocal melody, and uh, how we'd do it was we'd jam about with a riff, uh, come up with some kind of, I'd come up with a riff, um, and Ozzy'd sort of sing a, a type of a melody to it, and then Giza would write the words. And he was, he was fine to work with. I mean, as, as all people are in bands, you always get the, you know, uh, jokers and stuff. And Ozzy was like sort of the, the joke, you know. We, while we were putting stuff together, he'd be outside playing football, you know, or walking around the block or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, being self-taught, I, I, I imagine I've, I've come up with my own sort of, certain, particularly as I say earlier, with, with chopping into my fingers off, I've had to come up with certainly different chords, like certain full chords, if I play them, it, they're not always right for me to play, so I've come up with just certain un unorthodox chords, which should... I could play a lot with two, with using the little finger as opposed to that. Um, so I'll have a different way of perhaps approaching something than perhaps most other guitar players who, who've not chopped the ends of the fingers off. <laughs> but I'm saying that, uh, going back to the early days, I was in a, a group called The Rest with Bill Ward and the, another two chaps, Pete Radford, who would also chop the, end of, chop, chop the end of his finger off. So were both, there was two of us guitar players who both, <laughs> you know, both had the ends of the fingers chopped off. It was quite funny, really. Paranoid, again, was, wasn't really going to be as a single. We wasn't intending on doing a single. It was, we were in the studio to write an album, the Paranoid album, which was going to be originally called War Pigs, but that's why the cover was with a chap with a sword and a shield. Um, but they banned it from being called War Pigs, so we called it well, Paranoid, which had <laughs> nothing to do with the cover at all. But anyway, um, yeah, we went in to record the album, and in, in the lunch break, I stayed, I didn't go out to eat with the others, I just stayed around, uh, stayed at the studio, I just came up with this riff, this paranoid, and when everybody came back, I said, well, let's just, just put this down, so we put it down, and that was it, it wasn't intended as a single or anything, it was just uh, another one for the album, but it did come as a, as a single. <laughs> Black Sabbath and Paranoid were quite quickly recorded. Black Sabbath was done in two days, and um, 
Her and I was, uh, was five, five days to a week. It took us to do that, finish it. But Massaviati was quite a different thing. That took a lot longer. That's when we started getting into a long time for us. It was going into weeks, and we thought, oh, God, this is taking a bit long. We tried. There was one particular track that Bill couldn't get right. Uh, I think it was Under the Sun or something it was called. And we went to about three or four different studios because it wasn't, couldn't get the vibe in those days. I don't know how we got to that, but... Uh, I think, I think at the time they were, they, they were good for the time. I mean, listening to them now, obviously, it's, it's sort of cringe because of the, the sound and the whole recording world has changed and the, the, the way things can be done now. And I think, I think any past product you listen to, you always go, oh dear, we could have done this and we could have done that. And, but for the time, no, I think it was, it was all right. And Volume 4, the same. Uh, that was good for us at the time we'd done Volume 4 because it was the first time I think we'd actually recorded in America. And we went over to LA and it was great. It was great times. So, um, it's a whole new thing to be recording in sort of record plant and, and we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. It was good. I do use uh, a few effects on stage and rehearsals. Whatever. Mainly, I think uh, I have a delay on all the time, a quick repeat. Um, but I don't use, I don't use a, a lot of effects like most people would have like chorus and everything going at once. I, I just ten, tend to just use the straight guitar sound through, the, through a pedal board, into, giving out just a delay all the time. And on stage I'll use maybe a, a slow repeat, some, depending on what track and a chorus. Uh, while, while, but you know, it depends on for what particular part I'll be playing. Generally it's just straight, it's just straight um, sound with a delay. <laughs> Yeah, well, Sabbath, Pretty Sabbath is, again, I thought, for me, I thought that was the best album to date then. It was a lot more involved. And we'd done stuff, we went a bit more adventurous by using sort of perhaps uh, um, more acoustic sort of things and a bit more, a bit more musical, I thought, than the other, the other albums up to that date. Uh, again, we went over to LA. We'd done the same procedure we did with Volume 4, but it didn't work on uh, Sabbath, Pretty Sabbath. We went over, rented a house for a six months and went over there and same house and everything it just didn't work we couldn't get this just didn't get the same atmosphere and we couldn't write so we ended up coming back to england and went to clearwell castle in, in wales and wrote wrote sabbath pretty sabbath uh, there <laughs> Technical Exeter was uh, a time when we brought a keyboard player in instead of Giza or myself playing keyboards as we did on some of the past stuff. Apart from Wakeman played on uh, Sabbath Pretty Sabbath track. Uh, we brought a keyboard player and we were getting to use involved keyboards a bit more and we thought well we don't want to keep playing and we're not good enough to keep playing these sort of things. So we brought a keyboard player in when we wrote um, Technical Ecstasy. Um, and I must say, I quite enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed that album, although it, I think I was a bit too self-indulgent for me. I think I got a bit too over the top with it, because I got more into the production side then, and I was fiddling about. And, um, but yeah, I think it was probably a slightly apart from some of the other albums we've done. It was at the time of recording the Evelyn album, which wasn't called Evelyn album at that time, before that. And it just wasn't working, things just wasn't happening. We were ended up recording for 11, well, rehearsing for 11 months and nothing was coming up. So we'd come up with plenty of riffs and stuff, but no, there was no enthusiasm. So it just, it just had to come to an end and uh, we had to have a talk, so it's not going to happen. And um, it was the time when Ozzy 
went and I think at that time he was going through a lot of problems himself and and uh, we needed to sort of get away from each other and we needed to do our own thing I think or he certainly needed to do his own thing which he did and uh, quite successful with it <laughs> So we found up running, got him over to rehearsals, and um, it worked great. I mean, straight away it was like life into the band again by just bringing somebody new in, and the, the sparkle was there again, and it was really exciting. Everybody was like really ready to go again by whom somebody put something into it. You know. Of all the stuff we've had, was we had we had riffs, but no sort of vocal stuff. As he wasn't sort of singing, he was going through that much depression. He just didn't want to sing. So by having all these rips and so much for so long, to have somebody come in and sing to them was great for us and really refreshing. Uh, some of the things we had already written uh, when Ronnie, before Ronnie came, uh, so his involvement was, was good really because he came up with a few other ideas to add to the songs. Uh, so Children of the Sea, we we changed around with Ronnie's involvement, and of course the way he'd sing, he's a totally different singer to us. So the way he'd approach things was a lot more operatic if you like so it, it helped a lot for us to write and it was certainly easier to write for, for Ronnie or with Ronnie you know. it was a bit unfair to bring Ian into Black Sabbath and expect him to especially after being with such a, a name band as Purple for so many years and being sort of the main front character of Deep Purple to bring him into Black Sabbath and expect him to sort of sing all Black Sabbath stuff to how we, we were used to it a very difficult job, and um, particularly for somebody like him, of uh, say coming from Purple, and it, it just didn't quite work. Sort of expecting him to do that. And so, uh, under anything else, under a different name, it would have been great. Although we did do Smoke on the Water on stage, because I, I like that track anyway. And Ian wrote that one, so I thought it was a good thing to do. And since that, I've played Smoke on the Water about on two or three different occasions on different things with Ian. <laughs> The idea of the, of the band together was great, and we all got on really, really well, really exceptionally well. He's a great chap and great character.
Yeah, I think at the time, Sabbath were, Sabbath were sort of gone through a period of, of, of different people in and out, and it, it did get to a stage where you think, well, what, what do I do? I, I, I wanted to do Carry On, and I felt, you know, I hadn't left the band, so I didn't feel I should change the name of Black Sabbath. I, I'd been in the band since day one, and I, it wasn't me, it's everybody else who's just gone and come. Um, it was still Black Sabbath, as far as I was concerned, whoever was involved in it at that time, that's what I felt. But I, w I wanted to break away and do a solo project under Tony Iommi, which I did, um, called the Seven Star Album. But of course, as it went on, Tom went on, Black Sabbath was still supposed to have owned Warner Brothers another album. So they nabbed that one to become a Black Sabbath album, which did upset the cart a bit, because everybody who got sort of panned quite a lot for that people saying it doesn't sound like Black Sabbath and it's not a Black Sabbath, because it wasn't a Black Sabbath album, it was a, a solo project which became a Black Sabbath album without my involvement. Well, from, from that period, of course, the Seven Star, we had Glenn Hughes with us, and um, we went on to do a couple of dates, which didn't last too long. Uh, so we had to bring in a, another singer, and um, Ray Gillen had a short period with us. And then Tony Martin came up, who was a great singer, I thought, superb. And we'd done a, three albums with him. He'd done Eternal Idol with us, and uh, Headless Cross, and um, Tear. <laughs>
since uh, the headless crosswick cozy got involved with the band he's been really helpful we sat down together when we worked all the, the ideas out for that album and he'd go through a lot of the tapes uh, to listen, you know, we'd sort stuff out together and say, oh, this is a good riff, let's try it with this. And it was a great help to me to have Cozy involved. And, uh, of course, he's been a great friend for many years, for 20 years. So he's be always been my first choice to have after Bill, when Bill went. I always wanted to get Cozy in the band, of course, at the time it was never possible, but <coughs> it eventually did become possible when, um, you know, when he wasn't doing anything. But most of the times he's either been with White Snake or the LP or whatever it is, uh, and we've had somebody at the time anyway, so... <laughs> all the solos for all the tracks, are, uh, none of them are worked out, they're all off-the-cuff ones, and in fact, if I do them in the studio, I'll do umpteen different ones. I never very, really, really play them the same. And on stage, I'll do, there's always something slightly different. Um, I'm not the sort of guitar player that can sit down and play everything exactly note for note all the time. It has to be sort of, um, I like to do it off-the-cuff. <laughs> At the moment, I'm using Marshall 9000 series uh, amplifier and, uh, and rack mounted thing, which uh, my guitar chap over there, Mike Clements, is dying for me to get rid of. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I quite like the sound of it. Uh, and big plays is good. It rehearsals, it's not quite so good, but we've been working with that and working with various other gadgets at the moment. Um, Digitech being one of them, which we've just done a deal with, which is sounding, sounding quite interesting. They've got a few different things that seems to be quite good, but we're still in the beginning stages of fiddling with that at the moment. And we're using a, a box that Mike Clement built again. It's a, it's a um, splitter box and a, a, a treble booster, which is really good. Uh, I do try new stuff as we, as we come across it that I think might be useful. I'm not generally a gadget man. In fact, I haven't got a clear to work most of the stuff, to tell you the truth. Um, it's just, uh, if I hear a sound, I think, oh, that's, that's good, but I've no idea how to get it or uh, what it does, that, what it is that makes that sound. But if the, if the gadget's there, and Mike generally will tune it in, or Tony will tune it in and get the sound sort of one. <laughs> I went for one guitar lesson, and uh, that was it. I, I couldn't stand it anymore because I was—I felt I was playing better than what they were showing me at the time. They were trying to show me finger exercise, which I already sort of knew, and I, I didn't—I I just didn't have a, an interest of, of being shown. I had to sort of—I felt better in learning myself at the time. Although now I wish I'd have probably got more involved with uh, with training, learning the proper way. But then again, I may, may not have ad adopted my own style by doing that. I, I don't know. I think in some ways it's, it's good reading music and, and playing the proper way, but in other ways I think you can create your own different individuality by you doing it yourself.
by, by you learning to play that instrument yourself instead of like nowadays there's so many different things like videos in fact I've done a video myself an instructional video a, a few years ago um, so many of those available now to the to the kids that they can virtually do you know you can go and buy an amp that's sort of got this sound it can go and buy a video and show you how to play exactly this this particular phrase uh, and cassettes that do it, and everything's made a lot more easier now to, to be able to learn to play. And when you've got to sit down and do it yourself, it's it's bringing you out from your particular way of how you feel about things, how you can develop your own style as opposed to being shown exactly what you do. <laughs> At the moment, we're in the process of reforming one of the the old lineups with Dio. Uh, Giza, Dio, Cozy, Powell and myself, which uh, we've been rehearsing and it's been really good up to now. Um, and it looks like it's going to be quite a you know, successful band. We're, we're quite happy with what we're doing and uh, the next stage now is to go in and, and uh, record it. Mm -hmm. 